Welcome to the History of Parliament's YouTube channel. I'm Sammy Sturgis and I'm the Public Engagement Manager at the History of Parliament Trust. In this video from our Parliamentary Leadership series, I'll be speaking to Dr Andrew Thrush about William Cecil, later Lord Burley, which is how we'll refer to him throughout the video. Andrew is currently the editor of our House of Lords 1558-1603 project and previously edited the History of Parliament's House of Lords 1604-29 volumes, which are about to be published. Between 1558 and 1572, Lord Burley was Elizabeth I's Principal Secretary of State, the youngest man to be appointed to the office in the 16th century, and between 1572 and his death in 1598, he was Lord Treasurer. Naturally, Burley played the leading role in Elizabeth's parliaments, of which there were nine during his lifetime. He dominated the parliamentary scene for 40 years, first in the Commons, and then from 1571 in the Lords. Here we'll explore his rise to prominence and his capability and success as a parliamentary manager. So Andrew, can you briefly describe for us how Lord Burley rose to such a position of prominence? I think we can reduce this to, to four key factors, if you like. Um, first and foremost, Burley was clearly a man of exceptional intellectual ability. He was um, an excellent classicist, um, well trained in the law, um, but was also, I mean, had, had a, had a, a, a huge appetite for work and was able to process large amounts of information. So this was a man who was clearly of outstanding ability. But uh, that in itself would not have been enough. He also had other things in his favour. He had excellent court connections. Um, both through his father, who was a, a minor um, official at court, um, but also through his second wife, Mildred Cook, uh, who was the daughter of another minor court official. Um, you also have to allow for the fact that, 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 that apart from being intellectually capable, he also, uh, Burley has these great political instincts. He's got, he's got political acumen. He's, he knows which way to jump at key moments. Um, He's, so so that, that adaptability he helps ensure his survival so that he can get to the top job. And you ha can't also discount luck. I mean, he is, he is fortunate. I mean, had Mary Tudor managed to survive for many more years, I doubt we would have heard very much more of William Cecil. Yeah. And so as Elizabeth I's chief minister for much of his career, I'm guessing there were a particular set of um, roles and jobs that he had to do within that position but then it would be good if you could give us a sense of how that interacted with his role within parliament well yes I mean as chief minister you have an awful lot on your plate you have to manage foreign and domestic policy you've got you're constantly writing to ambassadors reading ambassador reports writing to English ambassadors abroad writing to the Lord Deputy of Ireland or so there's a huge workload um, you're issuing instructions uh, attending council meetings um, so you've got to do all that and when a parliament says you've got to you've got to take an interest in what's going on in parliament trying to manage it and and, and obviously some people some ministers would, would would do this better than others Burley with his tremendous capacity for work manages this to do this supremely well I mean, despite the fact that he's enormously busy on a huge range of fronts, he, not, he still turns up to Parliament fairly regularly. I mean, if you look in the early part of the, the reign, it's a, it's, it's, it, the percentages are very high. And even, even when he falls ill, because he, he is um, prey to, to, to illness from time to time, he manages to turn up. To, uh, there's one occasion, for example, in, in May 1571, where he's struck down by something that contemporaries describe as a quartan ague, uh, an illness that strikes every four days. Um, that he's taken into the House of Lords on a litter rather than not attend. Uh, even when he's he, in the old age, you know, in the final years of his life, he's still managing to put in an appearance with two days in every three, which is astonishing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and you mentioned, obviously, that he was in the Commons, and, and I think it would be good as well for us to get a sense of how his connections helped him to manage Parliament as his career progressed? Well, 
if you're the, 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 the monarch's chief minister, um, you have a number of things, in, advantages already built in, a built in advantages as well as any connections. You have uh, the fact that the Speaker of the House of Commons is chosen by the monarch. Um, and and, and they, these are usually career lawyers who are just anxious to impress and do the king, the king or the queen's bidding. Um, you've got privy councillors sitting in both houses. So you've got a, a, I've got a built in support system, if you like. But the, the connections matter with, with Burley because, because um, uh, he, has, he has got uh, uh, relatives in the house, the lower house, and, 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 and friends in, in both houses, people who he cultivates. And these, these, these friends are, are really of key importance to explaining how he's able to marshal the support he needs. Um, he himself is not a, a, a great landowner. He doesn't own. He hasn't got in his pocket lots of parliamentary seats like uh, like some. Um, but what he does have is, is people who wish him well, friends like Francis Russell, second Earl of Bedford, the West Country magnate who who has a very large body of parliamentary patronage at his disposal. And many of those being chosen for Bedford controlled seats are people we can connect with 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 Burley. So it's quite obvious that, that Bedford is working in tandem with, with Burley and, and putting his parliamentary patronage at Burley's disposal. Same is true of, of, of the Chancellor of the Duchy of Ancaster at the beginning of the reign. This is somebody called Sir Ambrose Cave, who is also returning, as a matter of course, Burley's, Burley's friends and clients. So there's this body of people that, 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 that that's, can be connected with, 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 uh, with Burley who, and, uh, who, who wish him well. Um, but he, he, connections is, are, are, are not just to with you know, friends and relations. It's also people who have, have, have feel the same way about religious matters as you do, for example. This is one reason why, why Bedford is cooperating with, 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 with Burley. Uh, there, are lots of, there are lots of hot Protestants and those who wish for, 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 the, for, the, for, for, for further Protestant reform who are keen to cooperate with, with, uh, with Burley. Yeah, and I can imagine it would be helpful to have people who have a similar agenda to you on all manner of things when you're in a position such as Burley. And that kind of nicely ties into the next thing that I wanted to talk about, which was um, allegiances, yep. particularly um, Burley's allegiances to allegiance to the Queen on, on particular issues. And it seems that there are several examples where um, those allegiances um, to the Queen or to the political nation could be questioned. Um, and I think it would be really useful if you could sort of speak to that wider issue in the first instance, but then maybe think about perhaps one of the most famous incidents where Burley's allegiances have been questioned, which is over the issue of the execution of Mary Queen of Scots. Yes, I mean, the, the wider issue is, put simply, is that, that um, the Burley and Elizabeth don't always see eye to eye. And Burley is, but Burley, Burley's views are in tune with those of the political nation at large, and with with, with most of the Privy Council. And these, the the, the problem is, is that Elizabeth um, is refusing, right from the start of the reign, to to marry. She prevaricates over a marriage, um, and therefore produce an heir. And she, and, and once it's clear that she's not going to be able to marry, she won't name a successor. So now th these matters are important because because the the continuation of the Protestant state is at stake here. Um, it, you don't, it, what these people don't want is to go back to another Mary Tudor, and that that seems to be what is what might happen if if Elizabeth dies. I mean, she almost dies in October fifteen sixty two of smallpox, and it, it causes um, a, a, a real chill to go through the, the Privy Council. They're desperately worried. So they need to find a way of persuading Elizabeth to, 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 to um, uh, name a successor or, and to automarry. And, and so, so Burley is on the horns of dilemma. He has to do, he has to try to persuade Elizabeth um, to uh, adopt a course of action that she's unwilling to do to, to, to follow. And so he, he ends up having to use parliaments to put pressure on her, added pressure to do the sorts of things that, that, that he wants. So his allegiance, as you say, is split. I mean, to the point where, I mean, there's one modern historian who's described uh, uh, Burley's actions in 1566, when the succession crisis is at his height, as controlled political schizophrenia. He is, on the one hand, you know, supposedly doing the Queen's bidding, 
And that's the way. But on the other hand, he's secretly fermenting sort of unrest, mm-hmm. trying to undermine what uh, Elizabeth's position, if you like, and trying to get her to do something she doesn't want to do. He's having to look two ways. He's having to be two faced, literally. Yeah. So thinking about Burley's split allegiances rather than schizophrenia, I think we'll call it. <laughs> um, one of the most famous examples of this in popular history is the issue of over the execution of Mary Queen of Scots. So I wondered if you could just dig into that example for us a little bit more with just with specific relation to Burley's split allegiances. Yeah, yes, I mean, Burley made no secret of the fact that he wanted Mary to be executed. I mean, in a sense, I don't think this was terribly secret, but what he was doing, and I'm not sure he, that the Queen knew he was doing this, was actually, you know, encouraging the Commons in 1586 to, to, to petition her. And also he went over the petition that the Commons produced line by line, changing words here and there, and tried to refine it, uh, knowing that, you know, that this was something that Elizabeth was going to, uh, to, to, to ball cap, and nonetheless using it um, uh, as further pressure on Elizabeth and, 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 and involving himself heavily in it. Of course, you know, it doesn't work, but nonetheless, he was, he was, um, he was pushing this line against the king, against the queen's wishes. Yeah. So given Burley's split allegiances over particular issues, do you think that affected his success as a parliamentary manager or do you think he was a successful parliamentary manager? Well, I think you have to ask the question um, if you're if, looking at the, the, if, if from the point of the, the monarch. Um, what do you what do you, what do you achieve for Elizabeth first of all? I mean, and, and and if you look at uh, his record in respect of of, of money grants, for example, the, you know, the, the the main reason why. Parliaments are summoned in this period is, is to obtain money for the crown. That's generally the reason. Um, he's he's overwhelmingly successful. He's not denied um, subsidies, and so from that point of view, uh, Elizabeth would have said, "Yes, he was perfectly successful, and he could have claimed success." Um, in respect of 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 the the agenda that he is he is pushing himself on behalf of the political nation, of course, he is less successful. He manages, for example, to get the Duke of Norfolk executed in 1572 as a result of parliamentary pressure, something that Elizabeth had been resisting. Norfolk had been involved in the Ridolfi plot of 1571, and, <clears throat> and he, was, uh, he was regarded as by, by Burley and others as too dangerous to be allowed to continue living. Um, so there is a success there. But on, on these other issues, on things like the, the, the succession and the execution of Mary Queen of Scots, um, Burley makes no headway. Elizabeth never uh, gives in to these parliamentary demands. And so you have to say that, that ultimately, despite what some modern historians have written about, about uh, Burley being this successful parliamentary manager, you have to say that this is a record of, of failure. Um, you can choreograph a parliament as much as you like. You can, you, can, you can have as many supporters as you like. You can have as much goodwill as you like. You can push, you can, you know, the whole thing can operate smoothly for you. But it's ultimately, if the Queen says no, you know, you haven't achieved anything. Yeah. And so what was his legacy after he left? Well, in the, in the very short term, you can see that Robert Cecil, who uh, is the, his second son and his political heir, and who is the first minister of the next one, James I, um, he draws upon his father's example. This playing a sort of double game, if you like, you know, where on the one hand you're you're meant to be the the, the, the monarch's first minister doing the minister the, the monarch's bidding, while on the other hand trying to undermine a key policy that they're pursuing uh, for their own good or rather for the good of the political nation. You see this happening in 1604 in respect of what was known as the Union, which was an attempt by James to to bring together um, uh, the kingdoms of, of England and Scotland into a permanent political union, and and, and Robert Cecil was aghast, like many of the political nation, because this would have immediately led to the extinction of English common law, um, which was a horrible concept uh, at the time. So you can see in the short term, there is, there is, there is, uh, you can see Burley's legacy sort of lives on in Robert Cecil. In the longer term, you could argue that, that, that through no fault of Burley's own, I mean, unavoidably, inescapably, that, that this, uh, this, this double dealing, as it were, had 
cast a long shadow. Because what it does, it necessarily involves giving the commons their head, uh, encouraging the commons to oppose the queen over and, and pressurizing the queen and, 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 and becoming difficult to manage. And it becomes so difficult to manage that, that Elizabeth, as early as 1570, is trying to avoid a parliament. Now, this is something that we, you know, disenchantment with parliament is setting in relatively early in Elizabeth's reign. And this is something that's tended to be overlooked. You know, we tend to think of disenchantment with, of par with parliaments as being an early Stuart phenomenon. And it results in personal rule, you know, the governing without parliaments, because parliaments are seen as being more trouble than they're worth. Well, this, is starts, this starts to be seen by Elizabeth, who can't dispense with them because she needs them for the war she's playing with. So she's, she's, she's trapped. But nonetheless, what you've done here is, is to give the commons their head. And in the long term, this is going to, do, this is going to um, annoy the monarch, making it much more harder for, 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 for ministers to, 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 to manage them on the behalf of the crown. And it also means, it also means the House of Lords begins to be eclipsed. You know, many, men, many, many members of the upper house were perfectly happy to let the commons do the dirty work for them, to put the pressure on the, on, on the queen. They can then have clean hands as they appear. And this is going on as, as late as 1604, and the commons sort of resent it. But once you give the commons their head, the, the lords start to be eclipsed. Now, again, many modern historians have tended to think, well, you know, that doesn't really matter. The, the lords were still in charge. After all, Burley City and the lords, it was therefore, therefore the most important house. I don't buy that. I think that's wrong. I think what's happening is you've got a period, you, the lords are, fall, are becoming very much um, the second chamber. They're playing second fiddle to the House of Commons by the time James comes to the throne. And I think that, that, has, that, that, that has, from the monarch's point of view, damaging consequences because the lords was the chamber in which the natural allies of the, of the monarch were to be found. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, well, thank you very much um, for speaking to me today, Andrew. That's been great. Um, yeah, so thank you also to all of our viewers and we'll see you next time on the History of Parliament YouTube channel.